Hey everybody, welcome to the Inmate Interviews Podcast. I'm your host, Shaggy360. I appreciate you for being here. Um, This is the first episode. I just wanted to give everyone a shout out and let you know about this great interview we have coming up. Um, It is with convicted murderer Nico Jenkins, who is currently on death row. Now, Nico's case is a very, very in-depth case and it's very extreme and it's not cut and dry it's not just cut and dry murders that happened here and that is one of the reasons i reached out to him and try to highlight this story um you know i research a lot of different cases just on my own and this one is one of the most extreme injustices that has been done in my opinion to somebody and um, you know I hope you enjoy this I hope you watch this with an open mind I hope uh, you understand I'm not glorifying killing Um, my condolences to all the victims involved here Um, they are not forgotten I'm not doing this to disrespect anyone's memory I am just doing this to show light on prisoners' plights. Um, Prisoners that I feel have have a real basis for injustice. And um, yeah, I hope you find this interesting. Um, Some of the things might be drastic, you know, explicit, but this is real life. Um, Yeah, watch our YouTube channel. Inmate Interviews. Um, You can also go to our website, inmateinterviews.com. We have a lot of videos and interesting stuff that's not posted here. Um, Yeah, if you would like to support, hit the Cash App, Inmate Interviews. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys this. Have a great day, and thank you for being here. Please comment and follow. All right, everybody. Um, first interview here. Um, it's your host, Shaggy360, Inmate Interviews. We have a very special guest, Nico Jenkins. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Nico's story as far as the media portrays it and as far as the state has put it out there. Um, we're we're going to go ahead and, and deep dive into the story in, in Nico's own words and, and see what's been going on and touch on stuff that's controversial and that hasn't been put out there. And it has to do with the state's negligence and, and other factors that we're gonna to touch on today. So hopefully everyone has an open mind, is what is willing to uh, see another side of the story that they probably never heard. So Nico, I wanna thank you for being here today, bro. Thank you, You're welcome. Definitely. I'm sure everybody's aware you know, of your story and everything and um, just to let everybody know that that you're currently on death row. Is that correct? Yes, I'm currently on death row. Man, all right. So, I mean, your case, your, your case, man, I, you know, I'm a little older than you, but I remember your case vividly, right? I remember watching it, and I remember the way the media portrayed you as like some kind of monster or something like this that you were just out, you know, for like kicks or thrills or something is, is how the media portrayed it. And, and you know, I just, I just want to ask you, like, do you feel you had a fair shot with the media? No, I don't feel I had a fair shot with the media due to the, to the racism that's in the state of Nebraska and the Ku Klux Klan members that uh, frequently hold events here in the state. And it's like these people, and I'm charged with killing a blind and blue eyed white woman. So, I, I, and I'm a black man, you know, so I don't, I don't think that, that I was betrayed. betrayed. I, mean, I don't think that I got a fair shake just because of the racism in this case and the, the public political aspect behind my case that was pressuring my judge and other uh, county attorneys in my case. Right. And 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 we're going to touch on that because you were kind enough to send me a whole packet of information, which was basically a special investigatory review from senators from the state of Nebraska. And I basically read over all the documents and, and I was shocked to find out a lot of these things that that I never knew before. And and I try to research your story, you know, like, and, and I don't find this stuff. Yeah. Let, let's get into to the beginning. So f- from a young man, you have been dealing with issues, with mental issues. Is, is that correct? Yes, I've been struggling with mental for over 25 years. And, and that's documented. 
and, and from the documents that I saw, I mean, this has been from the age of five. He, you know, Nico went to a special clinic that that went ahead and assessed him for multiple days, like over eleven days. And and you know, this has been documented. I have seen the proof. This is in the state's investigatory report. So I mean, all this is documented. And um, I, I mean, this has been an ongoing thing that the state and everyone knew about. Child, man, I was committed to the psychiatric hospital for evaluation, and then basically I was given medication. There. After I got out of there, I had to go see a psychiatrist for nine months. And and because you were a child, they couldn't clinically diagnose you. Is that right? She couldn't clinically diagnose bipolar disorder because there was no no, no uh, scientific evidence to support it in a child and children. So I was ahead of the times. Got it. My disorder and my mental illness was ahead of the time because the psychiatric community, the doctors hadn't seen, wasn't seeing patients suffering with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia at an age of that young. So basically, they changed that now. Now the child children are diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. It's because it's been from back then in 1995, my doctor was literally wasn't empty for me to diagnose me. Her her hands were tied. So basically, she she felt you were an extreme case, and she was trying to to get that documented and get you help. But her hands were tied legally, like with some bu bureaucracy, to where she couldn't go ahead and and try to further the treatment to the next level. Yeah, basically, basically, she testified she testified in court on 2014 July at my uh, conference that also those same childhood evaluations. Today, she would be ethically permitted to diagnose me as bipolar disorder. And so she said that all of those same evaluations, she would have diagnosed me as a child form of bipolar. She said that on her own in 2014 at my conference here, Dr. Jane Udelke. Right. And, and I mean, you know, that's just, that just shows you that, you know, um, the way the legal system is and everything, every state has their own definitions of things. They make their own laws. And, and, and you know, um, we're going to touch on that, but I, I just, I just want to go over this for people to understand that, you you know, from a young man, you've been trying to get help. Your family has been trying to help you. You, you have a mom that loves you, correct, Nico? Yes, yes my mother loves you very much. She's always been supportive of me. Your mom, later on in life, before you got released in 2013, even tried to petition for you to get committed before you're released, basically to not have you released on your date and to have you committed beforehand. And that was stopped. That was sabotage. My mother did try to get me civilly committed to the psychiatric hospital before I was released. She filed her own petition in Johnson County Courthouse down in where the Brack, where uh, the council prison is in the state was state in Nebraska, Johnson County, and then uh, the, the rogue psychologist, I would like to say, Dr. Mark Weilich, that's his name, Dr. Mark Weilich, he, he lied to the county attorney when they called up here to prison in Tecumseh and asked for my mental health business. And that's why the, the special investigative committee of LL424, they found out and uncovered all the conspiracies that he committed in the document, the evaluation that he withheld have in your possession. This is February 4th, 2013. That's uh, evaluation by Dr. Natalie Baker, who's my treatment psychiatrist. And, and you know what, Nico? I had no idea of Dr. Wheelage. And um, we're going to get into that because I got a lot to say about Dr. Wheelage. But basically, Dr. Wheelage has a big part to do with this story. And he is basically a doctor that works for the Department of Corrections. And you had a bunch of other clinical doctors, um, I would say about four, if not more, that basically were saying you need to be committed. And this one doctor that worked for the Department of Corrections sabotaged that. And, and we can even say conspired because a conspiracy is when two people or one or more persons conspire to commit an act. So, I mean, I don't think this Dr. Willage was just some rogue doctor, you know, I, and, and because he worked for the Department of Corrections, you know, I mean, I'm sure someone was pulling the strings, telling him to, to do these things as well. C c can we safely kind of say that something like that? Uh, the directors of the, of the, of the department. 
Yeah, and, and Nico, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of the viewers won't understand that just like like politics, like in a government with the Democrats and Republicans, there's there's politics in 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 prison system, is there not? Yeah, there's politics. There's a lot of politics that goes on with this prison system, and the higher ranking of this uh, the administration when it comes to the uh, central office. In the higher administration, they basically go ahead and they meet with lieutenant governors, the governor, people high up in the state that make these decisions. And then they align their 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 thoughts and their actions based on, on who their friends are higher up. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so, I mean, we'll get into all that because it's, it's real, real interesting. And and um, we'll also we'll also we'll get into a bunch of stuff, but. Basically, from a child, you were having these issues, and and your mother and your family try to get you help, and you you have been documented. There was also some good doctors that tried to get you help. Not every doctor is bad. Not you know, I mean, they were definitely trying to get you help as well. But for one reason or another, it just got to the point where they couldn't treat you effectively and correctly. And from a child, you were hearing voices. Yeah, since I was a kid, I mean. Okay, so as a child, you know, um, one story that that I saw was, you know, you bring in you bring in a, a, a gun to school and showing it off to your friends when you were a young child and and things like that, you know. So so you did have like a few troubles in school and and, and things of that nature, right? Yeah, but all of those things that I did was done because of my voices told me to do it. So I remember those times. So even, right. So, so even as a child, you were hearing these voices, but, but naturally you're a kid. You don't, you don't know what these voices are. You don't know who they are. You're just hearing these voices. Right. And, and even at that age, you, you were hearing voices to tell you to do things. Yes. Okay. All right, and 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 I'm sure the counselors and everyone was aware of this. Yes. Then on we go, and, and you start to mature as a young man. You start to grow up. You're in your town. You also have, you know, some issues with like family and environment and things of that nature. You know what I mean? That obviously could play a part in everything. But but from a young age, Nico was hearing voices, and and he was telling people that here's he is hearing voices. Now, I mean, maybe, you know, if I went to my mom and told her, you know, I saw someone under the bed or heard a voice, she might not believe me, right? I'm a kid. She might not really take me that serious, right? Yeah. So, so is that kind of like, you know, how to, how people around you were like, oh, he's just a kid. He's just hearing stuff. This is imaginary friend, something like that. Yeah, basically, for a while, that's how I was until it started to my actions started turning more violent towards my sister and uh, being more violent in school and stuff like that. Right. And, and, and that must have been hard, bro. I, that, that must have been hard as a kid to go through that and not understand why I just hear it, you know, and, and man, I, as you as you matured and as you grew up, these voices. And, and when we say voices, it's not like voices like just some unnamed voice. At, at the time when you were young, you didn't understand who, but later on in life, at some point, you understood that it was the Egyptian god Apophis, also known as Apep. Yeah. Yes, it was. And at what age was that? Well, I, I, Apophis was really touched me at 19. Okay. When, when you were in prison for the first time. Yeah. For people that don't know on Apophis, can, can, can we kind of go over Apophis. I, I try to do a little research, you know what I mean, just on my own, just so I'd be able to, to converse with you on it and understand, you know, what this is. Ba basically, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Nico. Uh, I said, I said, I explained. Okay, Apophis is the great serpent of the underworld named Egyptian. Uh, it's a serpent that Egyptian worship. It's like a serpent that Egyptian worship. Right. And, and, and fr from what I read, it, story goes that 
Apophis, Apep was was basically created from the umbilical cord of Ra, and Ra is the sun god. So basically, Apophis is the opposite of the sun god. And every night, Ra would go down into a, basically like kind of a ship through dusk to to dawn, I believe, or, or before it becomes dawn, he has to go through this dark place where he basically, him and other gods that are on the ship fight Apophis nightly, but Apophis cannot be killed because then that would go ahead and, and, and cause imbalance in the universe because of, of, of the balance situation. Is, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good so <laughs> thank you, bro. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I take this seriously, man. I take your time seriously and, and I take your life seriously, bro. And, and, you know, all I want to do is, is, is yeah, I, I just want to get the real story out there for people to understand. I mean, this is, you know, some serious stuff. And, and, and this is Nico's life we're talking about. And this is not someone that just went out there and off a of hype, off of, off of trying to do something, did this. And, and this is this has been a lifelong issue for Nico. And he's been trying to get help. So, you know, I, I just want to put that out there for everyone. So and, and Nico, I, I mean, my first thought when when I started doing research and, and you know, I, I've, I've read the book of Enoch. Right. I, I've done research on the Bible. I, and things like that and um i didn't even know who apep was so so how does a boy from nebraska learn about apep you know what i mean like uh, yeah mine's, mine's, mine's a spiritual revelation and um i had did a huge sacrifice on myself a blood sacrifice where i caused slippers of war on my face like i caused these lines through my face and through my eye and 29 stitches the first time in the I wrote a blood message on my wall and it said Apophis equals equals. And uh, I wrote that on my wall and blood and I was praying to him and I was praying to him and I was talking to him and that, that's what that's what did the so he's been there ever since. He kind of giving me trouble and telling me that's a worship and to be a sacrifice that that is the only way to get the power of the gods stuff like that man i mean that's intense you know and 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 that's real and and people have to understand like um nico was charged with the crimes but from everything that i've gathered from reading reading the story and reading his history um it seems like nico was not even in his body at that moment to me it seems like you know like he he wasn't even aware of what was going on like and 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 you guys have to understand um, me and Nico spoke briefly the other day, and he told me his his sister heard him speaking some some language that that was so foreign that no one could even understand. And 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 you know when I was doing research, reading these files, one of the uh, doctors actually had one of your letters, and they said about a third of it was was some kind of language that they couldn't even decipher. Yeah, that's what the, that's what the, the ancient prophets and the serpents and the demons they revealed to. Uh, spiritual man so 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 i mean getting deeper in life so so we know that we know that that this is not just some kid trying to get trying to get his thrills off this ain't some kid trying to act cool this ain't some some kid trying to do a little initiation to a gang this is someone that's been hearing voices this is nico has been hearing voices nico has been going through this for years and doesn't understand why and the powers to be can't help them in that fashion. So, so as you grow up as a young man, you get mature, not mature, but, but you start to grow up at about 17 is, is, is when the first kind of criminal acts got serious to where you ended up getting locked up for, for a long term. Is that right? Yeah, actually, I was 15. I did the crimes. I did the crimes when I was 15. I robbed some people. Okay. So, oh, I robbed with a gun. And, uh, then I went to prison at 316. January, uh, January of 2003, all the way until July 30th of 2013. I was about 17 and a half years. And do they charge you as an adult? Yes, I got charged as an adult at the age of 16. Man. Uh, see, and and that's where the, the justice system is messed up. Some states do that all the time, and then some state it, they, it's at their discretion. Basically, it's how they feel about you. It's, it's like how the judge basically feels about you. He takes a look at you, whatever his feeling is. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to give this kid a chance or I'm going to, you know, charge him as an adult. It's just basically how they feel about the situation. The judges have the discretion to charge you as an adult or not. Is that right? Yes, of course. Yeah. 
Yeah, so a lot of people don't understand that. It's like they think, oh, he had to be charged as an adult. No, he didn't, you know. So, I mean, right off the gate, they're already giving you the max. They're, they're not listening to you. And, and at that point, they weren't even taking account your mental condition as well, right? Yeah. I hope the audience is listening to this. So I hope you guys are starting to paint the picture here because we're going to go into some deeper stuff. So these two cr offenses happen, you know what I mean? And there were two carjackings. We don't have to get d into it. You know, people go go read and find out about that. But basically that happened. Nico ended up incarcerated. And it was, if I'm not mistaken, Nico, it was, it was about 15 to 17 years and then after some in incidences while being incarcerated they um increased the time to about 18 to 21 years is that right yeah that's correct cool. that's correct cool. I, I got charged with a second degree assault uh second degree felony assault on an inmate in a riot situation and then i got charged with another assault on a uh lieutenant okay and, and and, and I'm sorry about your grandma passing while you were locked up. And, 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 and I just want to give everyone kind of some context. All this time, you're still hearing voices and you're not getting treatment. Okay. Okay. So while being incarcerated, what really got me when I, when I went over these documents, right? I went over that packet that I got sent over. And thank you for that again. I mean, they, the state, the investigatory panel, basically has a timeline of your time and how many transfers you had and how much time was in actual segregation or confinement and things of that nature. And I got to say, it's it's crazy to look at, Nico. It really is, bro. And, I'm, you know, I'm sorry you went through all that. And, and you know, um, just to give people an idea, like, I, I'm not an expert in the prison system, but is it is it common for them to transfer someone so many times, Nico? No, it's not. It's a lot because of being problematic and I was I was starting riots and gang warfare and stuff like that in the prison system and stuff like that so and at that time, th there was a state hospital, right, Lincoln Lincoln Regional Center, that could have com had you committed and could have treated prisoner uh, prisoners or you or any prisoner at that point if if they did the right their due diligence and did it right, correct? Yeah, yeah. You probably have been under medication. They put me under a forced antipsychotic injection that I'm under right now. They would that that states basically that. I have to take my medication every 21 days to the injection because I don't, I refuse to take oral medication. Right. I'm forced to that antipsychotic injection that if I don't take it, five guards will get right here and they'll come in the room and rest me to the ground and get forcefully injected. And that just agitates you more. That just agitates the condition more. Yeah, it does. But I, I never made them forcefully give it to me. I just take it. Okay. And, and, you know, Nico, just speaking with you today and the other day, I got to say, man, like, you, you know, you seem just like a, a, a straight down to earth. And, and I don't know how long you've been on your uh, medication, but I mean, you seem at, at a good space right now in your head, bro. I am. Good, man. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, bro. And, and um, I, I want to go into the time. So a lot of people don't understand mental illness. I'm not an expert either. I'm not some psychologist, but you know, um, I'm a human and I, I could just see from reading this. Now, I'm not no expert, but if someone's telling me they're hearing voices and, and I try to put them in a room for 23 hours a day, months on end, I, I would think that would intensify the voices. Is that, was that what was happening? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, basically, the, the long-term isolation and segregation of uh, solitary confinement exacerbated my mental illness and made it worse and what's crazy is, I mean, if you guys think Nico was just saying this, the state's own Senate committee found that an inmate with zero mental conditions going in after long term solitary confinement will come out with all kinds of, of mental conditions, anxiety, uh, PTSD, fear. And, and that's a, an inmate with zero conditions going in. So imagine how this amplified Nico's Nico's feelings and Nico's, Nico's condition. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I just really want to get that out there so people could understand what, what was going on. It says here that out of out of your your time um, and and when were you when were you uh, what year were you locked up the first time at at um, 16? January of 2013. I mean, January of 2003. 
of 2003. So basically for over 10, for 10 years, uh, give or take, Nico was incarcerated. And this is by the committee's own findings, 60% of the time, 23 hours a day in se segregation, the NDCS found. He was transferred to multiple securities with varying degrees of security levels. And I mean, that's crazy. And then it actually has a timeline here of the lengths of, of the stints that he spent in this confinement. And, and it, it goes anywhere from 40 days to literally about a year on end, straight, continuous. Is that right? Years at a time, basically, yeah. Damn. I mean, I can't even imagine how that was, bro. I can't even imagine. It's like even for a normal inmate. And, and this is why you're a young man growing up, dealing with these voices, and, and you're trying to figure it all out. Let, let's go up to the time about six months before your release, when when things got more intense and, and when you basically, you were going to get released, you were going to get discharged, which means for everyone who doesn't know, he was zero conditions out, out on no parole, zero parole. And he was going to be released, you know, basically to the public to, to live his life. So six months to go, you've been spending most of your time in segregation. Did they give you any mental treatment, any kind of program to rehabilitate you before you get out or to, to help you uh, reintegrate into society, anything like that? time offender, I was supposed to be eligible for uh, work release programs, uh, eligible for parole, to get early release. I wasn't given none of that. I wasn't given parole. I wasn't given no work detail, work release. I was not given any kind of mental, mental health treatment. I wasn't given any psychiatric medications. Damn, and and I and I got a question, Nico. Is is Nebraska kind of like a small town feel with the government there? So, for instance, I I know how small town shit works, and and basically, like let's say you or your family members are known by the police. So then the DA knows these police officers, and then when they when when any one of you would have a case, they'd be like, oh oh, here goes this family again. Let's let's wash them. Is that basically the feel of the Nebraska legal system? Yes, basically. Okay, so so I mean, not to put anyone on blast or anything out there, but ne some of Nico's family members have had issues with the law as well. So Nico's family is known to the to to the DA to to everyone in this community, you know, to to, to basically law enforcement in the community. So that also has a big part to play in all this. All right. And as you guys will see, we'll talk a little more. I'll try to get to it pretty quick. But basically, um, Nico's race and look also has something to do with this. And, and if you guys don't believe me, we'll talk about this and, and I'll go over the reasons. Six months before you start requesting help, you start Apophis starts speaking to you more intense and you start to get these voices basically telling you if you get released, you're going to kill people. And, and, and you trying not to to get released, which which sounds weird to some people because we know every inmate's trying to get out. But at that point, you as a man felt if I get released, these things will happen. And you were trying to tell people and warn people and, and basically stop it from happening. And you wanted to get committed and, and you even help your mom even was trying to help you in the process. Your mom was trying to help you in the process and they basically didn't commit you. And if you want to talk about why, Nico. Okay. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you the reason why I didn't get committed because it was a governmental and there was a there was a doctor by the name of Dr. Victor Mark Wallach. He is a psychologist who lied to the county attorney and withheld my evaluation that I sent to that I sent to uh, Shaq yeah. uh, 360 Nazis in his possession. The evaluation that uh, my doctor Natalie Baker evaluated me three months before I was released. And basically, what happened was in my doctor Baker's evaluation, she documents that. Um, um, I'm, uh, you know, just so, I cut into my face again, slippers of war, I had stitches that well and below my right eye. I was confusing that I'm taking stitches out uh, my uh, eye. I'm sorry, Nico. C can I cut you off for one oh, quick right. second, bro? Is that okay? Um, may I ask, Nico, how how in solitary and all that were they letting you get razors, bro? And, and how was it keep happening? I mean, I've been, I've been watching a news clip on the judge even asked, how was this still happening? Okay. Well, the time that I, the time that I cut into my face, I used my glasses, actually. I wasn't, I wasn't, I was able to get razors from like other inmates and stuff like that. And, and, and sometimes some of the guards would give them to me too. Some of the guards that were cool would give them to me because I would use guard for patient tattoos. Okay. And 
So they basically weren't tripping. They were like, man, if he kills himself, whatever. They were they weren't really tripping like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry to cut you off, Nico, but but yeah. Um, okay. Well Dr. Wallach, he lied, he intentionally lied to the Johnson County attorney, Richard R. Smith, who came called up to the to come to prison and asked him about many men and dangers. And at the time I was, my evaluation from Dr. Natalie Baker revealed she said in the evaluation that at this time a patient accused of men and men dangerous and you know, of civic commitment to ensure the safety of others. And she also documented it that I told her about human sacrifice to a promise that I was pledging to be the avenger and that I was going to uh, commit a human sacrifice upon my release. And that's why she said that, that I would be civic committed to the hospital, I would be sent to the hospital upon my release. But when the Johnson County attorney, Richard R. Smith, called him to the prison and asked, was I really, really dangerous? Mark Wallach intentionally withheld It, I'm it's, I vouch I vouch for it. I, I read the documents, Nico, and, and, and you know, you're you're absolutely correct. And I mean it's shocking to see. It's shocking to read that this one that you basically had four doctors stating the same thing. You you had uh, multiple doctors over the years and they all basically concluded access one, access two conditions. And they basically were all in agreement that Nico needs help. This one doctor and, and it, this goes back to politics. Yeah, it, this goes back to politics. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nico. Right. And, and on top of that, there is an actual law in the state of Nebraska that basically states anyone asking to be committed and, and exhibiting certain certain things, which you were exhibiting all of them, by the way, they should be committed and they have a right to be committed. And they basically denied you this right. And, and, you know, people talk, you know, critical about the police or the government or anything. It's like, you know, a citizen is a citizen, but when someone's in the government, they take an oath, they have a standard that they have to follow and they, and they have the law that they have to go by. And when they go ahead and deny people their rights and they deny people, you know, things that, that are afforded to them by law. I mean, that, that's why we talk about it. You know, that's why we, we talk bad about these people. Right. And, and I just want everyone to know that Nico had every right to be committed as a prisoner as as any person in the state and and his mom even tried to help him like any mother would do for their son and and he was denied and and dr wheelage worked for for the department there corrections in nebraska so you need to understand these other doctors were basically third party neutral neutral bodies and this doctor worked for the Department of Corrections and they have their own agenda, people. And if you guys think that they don't, you, you guys don't know about the world. All right. They got their own agenda that they're trying to push. And there is not it's not one rogue doctor wheelage. It's, it's not, you know, a mistake. He forgot to do this. This guy intentionally withheld this information so that Nico would not be able to get the treatment that he needed and, and was afforded by law.
friends and put me on death row and try to kill me and leave me and shut me up and sweep this controversy and this conspiracy out of the world because they know that they were responsible for this, but they would never think that it was going to come into their into their environment, into their community. But it came to like, this 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 their their lives and their people came back to harm them. They came back to, to harm them in their community. Man, and, and and you know what? I, I'm gonna touch on that, Nico, because if people think Nico is just talking talking shit, which he's not, I just I just want to tell you guys, and, and and rest in peace to everyone here, but the to the victims, but the Parkland shooter, who's a young white male who looks, I mean, like some college kid, he looks like some nerd, okay, killed, murdered 17 people, and he was spared the death penalty recently, okay, spared, all right. Yeah. 17 people and was spared the death penalty recently and and you know you guys need to understand uh, basically nico was locked up and the death penalty wasn't even active in the state of nebraska y'all all right this is this is fact while nico was locked up they had a push to go ahead and put the death penalty back into place and nico is the first person to be sentenced under the reinstatement of death row in the state of Nebraska. You guys think that this is a coincidence? Is that right, Nico? It's not, man. It's racist. Yeah, you're right, man. It's racist hatred, man. That's what it is. And, and, if, you put, and if you put a, 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 a picture side by side of Nico and a Parkland shooter, I mean, you could see why they would put Nico as like the face of evil. That's all you read. When, when you when you try to pull up Nico, oh, the face of evil, this evil. But man, it's it's based on racism, the way Nico looks, his tattoos, you know, they're they're not impartial. When it comes to the law, it's gotta be impartial. All that should not matter. We're talking the justice system here, all right? We're not talking the judge should not have any feeling about Nico's look, his face, his tattoos, or anything, his race, nothing. You know what I mean? So is it just a coincidence that the Parkland shooter looks like some nerd and he got off no death penalty, they decided, with, with murdering 17 victims and that Nico was plastered as the face of evil for the whole state of Nebraska and then they went ahead and, and pushed the death penalty reinstatement. Also, some, some other laws about like good time and things like that. Is that right, Nico? So, so what other what other laws were they trying to push while while you were locked up and basically plastering your story every time that? Yeah, when I got locked up, yeah. Yeah, when I got locked up they was trying to increase the uh, mandatory minimum sentences, making it so you go to prison for longer periods of time for lesser crimes. They was trying to uh, say that uh, they was going to take away the good time law. So whether like right now in the state of Nebraska, every prison term is half half of it. You only got to do half of it. So if you do 20 years, you only got to do 10. They were trying to change all of that because of one case. And they, 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 they were usually on the legislative floor, literally, got my picture and image and case before I was even sentenced and trying to pass those new laws. And, and and I got I got one question, Nico. When um you know I I saw the footage the day that that this three judge panel sentenced you um you know um and, and it was basically their discretion right and and they basically had a choice and they didn't even factor in your mental illness and and on your trial did they bring in like like an Egyptologist or or, or, or these specialists to to even for, for these jurors to understand like the depth of all this I mean this is not made up this is you know what I mean it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was ineffective on my counsel my, my, my public defender didn't do anything for me like at my at my uh my, my uh, death penalty trial, he was supposed to call my childhood evaluation. He was supposed to call my cousin, Christine Bordeaux. He was supposed to call other doctors, that Dr. Eugene Oliveto, all those doctors that diagnosed me with super affected by bullets. He didn't call any of them as witnesses. And that's why right now I have an appeal in on all of that. And Man. My case is going to get overturned on those merits. I, I can't believe that. And, and, you know, I mean, it's not no secret. Ineffective counsel will... It can just ruin someone. So I, I, I mean, and you know, there's a lot of dumb public defenders, public pretenders. You know, they they basically 
the state pays them minimal, you know what I mean? And even public defenders have bias and you may not believe me, but public defenders also, they say they're on your team, but that's just because legally that's what side they're on, but they themselves might have a bias and it's up to them to do an effective job or not. And in Nico's case, you know, he, he's stating he has, he didn't get an effective counsel. Nebraska is a predominantly Caucasian state. Is that right? How, how many people, Nico, if I could ask, are, are currently um, on death row? Uh, I think like 12 or 13, something like that. And do, you, and, and do you know off the top of your head how, how, how many are of, uh, you know, color or, you know, Latin, Latino? Or? Well, most of, the, most of the population is Hispanic over here. Okay. There's only one other white, you know, two other whites and one other black dude over here. And then the rest of the black, you know. And that's in a state that's predominantly white. So, I mean, does that mean that just yeah. Latinos and black people do crimes? I mean, it, does that sound right? <laughs> like, like that's that's crazy, man. And, and, and I'm trying to put all this out there, Nico, because a lot of people don't think about these things, man. They 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 just watch some dumbass YouTube video for a minute and they think that's the truth. And oh my God, this is how it is. And 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 then they they even never try to do the research to really get in depth and find out the truth, you know. So, I mean. I just feel like you were a young man dealing with a lot of mental issues and that they basically conspired against you for you not to get your treatment. And when you got out, those voices were so intense and and they basically the murders happened. You know, you know what I mean? And and you yourself filed a lawsuit against the state because of that as well as a family of one of the victims sided with Nico and basically said the same thing as Nico and, and sued the state as well. And wh where did those cases go? Uh, no, they, was, she, they basically swept under the rug and done, uh, nothing was done about them. They, they didn't get to go through the legal system. They got stopped and she cut short. Man. By the judges. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure, Nico, how it works with like the appeals process and everything, but where where is your your case right now, bro? I'm in post conviction, and I'm currently filed a motion that I'm literally in competency to be executed, so I should be having the competency hearing sometime soon in the near future. And, and is the competency hearing like the first step for you to get a, another mental evaluation? Yeah, for me to get another mental evaluation and get taken off death row because then I'm my mental illness is, makes me greatly disabled because of my mental illness. That's what they say every six months about. Me. And and Nico, can I ask basically like how how are the conditions now? Are they are they better than years ago? Because I, I mean I could only imagine what they were, man. All all those years uh -huh. leading up. Okay. We get our own room, we get our own showers in our cells, we got our own yard boards in our cells, so we got pretty big rooms, the biggest room in the, in the, in the prison here to come to their room, so. That's good to hear, man. So I, it, it, it sounds like you're in a better place right now. Yeah, it is better than I was before. That's cool, man. But we're trying to get you off death row and, and no disrespect to the victims. I mean, I, I even believe that Nico was just not even in his own body at that, at that time of the crimes, you know, and we won't go over it too much, but I'm, that's crazy that you say that. That's crazy that you say that about me not being in my own body at the time of the murders and that I was insane because that's the truth and that's what my appeal is all about. My death penalty appeal is about me. I was insane at the time of the crime because I thought this was already started, but my cousin Christine Bordeaux she told the police officers in an interview, she's crying to them, telling them that Nico, Nico was talking to some other kind of language. That wasn't him. That wasn't him. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know what he was doing. I've known him my whole life. He was always talking about human sacrifice. That's all he was talking about. He was obsessed over it. That's what she was telling the police crying. And I still have to get her testimony and get that in the court of law. But it's going to come out. And that's something that's going to be coming out real soon. It, it, it needs to come out, bro. And, and, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, there's gangbangers that just shoot someone and get initiated. There's there's people have a bad day, pull out a gun and kill someone like Nico's case is extremely different. Everyone for for oh, I mean, for years. Right. But I mean, for the six months leading up to his release, 
he was basically telling them, this is going to happen. You need to stop me. I want to be committed. He was basically trying to protect the public and trying to commit himself. Now, I, I, I ain't no genius, but I mean, I don't think there's there's inmates trying to stay in prison or incarcerated longer than they should be. You know what I mean? So so for Nico to be doing that is is almost like a person knowing that th this is over his head and 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 this is controlling him and he's and and apophis is telling him to do this and and he's basically trying to protect the public and 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 they didn't stop it is is that fair to say yeah that's exactly what happened that's exactly what happened the main thing about it is the situation is that like i said before i was trying to keep myself committed because i knew that i wasn't even controlling myself and i knew that when i had psychotic episodes that i couldn't stop myself and i, I wasn't even controlling myself and that's why i needed some medication and therapy sessions to stabilize right and also you were you were a young man you know what i'm saying like you were 16 15 17 i mean you know you i mean to be locked up in in in, in grown prisons for, from a young age zero direction zero prospects zero support i mean not i'm not saying not from your family but i'm saying from the system you know like as far as schooling getting you the mental help you needed as well as as giving you some kind of prospects when you get out you know what i mean so like i, I want everyone to understand the whole picture and see it from, from from this angle and hopefully you know with an open mind you got you guys could could understand and and you know look at nico as a person as who he is like a human being like any one of us he has a mother he loves you know he has a family um may i ask nico do you have remorse even though you know you were not in control that day but do you have remorse for what happened yeah of course of course i have remorse i wish none of this never happened that's why i try to protect this, the lives of others yeah they stay in prison to get treatment to get mental health to get medication to get therapy to stabilize that's why i try to do that i try to do that because i was trying to protect people and i i'm still to this day i have bad nightmares about what happened you know what i mean my heart is broken man like i, I wish i never was released and that's the thing is that this this system needs to be held accountable for what they did man it was illegal they intentionally did what they did to me to change the lives of other people yeah. It's greatly affected the lives of other people and the victim's family, man. And that's something that the victim's family needs to come to the forefront and speak on to the back too as well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. The victim's family to, 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 to grasp the reality that what happened to them was not an accident. It was the intentional actions of the state of Nebraska prison system. They they need to be aware and direct their anger, you know, at, at the at the responsible entity you know what i'm saying like like if they spoke up pro people will probably listen when it you know but but it affected yeah. multiple people multiple families including your own the victims families i you know i want to send my condolences and 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 go condemns i mean i think nico condemns murder he's not proud or anything as all of you can see he's remorseful he was trying to to bait he was yelling it off top of like the highest tower in new york city and nobody was listening and then the people that were trying to help him got thwarted they got stopped by shady dr wheelage all right and i'm gonna look into this dude um you know nico i'm gonna look into him bro when, when, when i do my little backstory on this and I'm, I'm gonna get some more information on this doc but i mean it 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 is a conspiracy, everyone. Go look what conspiracy means. It's when two people conspire to commit an act. And and I don't think it was Dr. Wheelage on a rogue mission. It, this, this was a conspiracy by the department, maybe even higher up. Yeah, Cameron White was his boss. Cameron White was his boss, and he knew about it too. And then the director, then the director. So the conspiracy goes, Mark Wallace, Cameron White, the director, Robert Houston. So it was three of them. So yes, it was a conspiracy. It, yeah, and, and and not only that, like you, you may think, okay, this this doctor forgot or whatever. no, it it was the ombudsman. He deliberately didn't send information there. He, right. I, I mean, I mean, this is crazy. I, I got all the documents, and I don't know if you want me to put them out there, Nico. But you know, um, if if you want me to put, I was just about to tell you, I'm glad you just brought that up. I was about to say to put them on your website, like the evaluation, I? like power evaluation. Yeah. Put it on your website, man. Put it out there, man. I want everybody to everybody. Inmateinterviews.com. I will. I'll go ahead and put that up as well with uh, Nico's interview on Cut. You know what I mean? And um, 
We're going to put that up there. I'm going to have it in a PDF format so all you can do your own research because this, this information is important and, and it's going to give you a different take on the story. You know, I mean, I mean, Nico, bro, well, you know, when I look, when, when I try the most search word, they always try to put evil on you, things like that, the face of evil. I, I mean, I don't feel as justified, bro. You know what I mean? And, and, you know, I got tattoos and everything. And I don't think a person's race look any e even outburst them knowing that you have a mental condition. They should be impartial. This is the legal system. They shouldn't be feeling some type of way and giving these crazy ass sentences and, and, and denying care to anyone, not only Nico, but to anybody. So, I mean, I hope Nico's story you know what I mean, gets out there. And I hope that people realize that Nico is a human being with a family, has remorse and, you know, is, is fighting for his life here. Nico's on death row, everybody. So, you know, he's, he's fighting for his life. And, and, you know, however you may feel before you watch this, I hope you guys have an open mind. Give Nico the time and, and, and the respect that you would anyone else, because he is a human being and he did try to stop all of this. All right. I'm not a psychologist. But I, I can clearly see that, Nico. I just want to tell you, bro, man to man, I can clearly see that. Thank you, man. You know, we're coming up on an hour right now, about four minutes, about three minutes. Anything else you want to say to anybody, Nico? Uh, my thing is just uh, everybody reading the LR 444 Special Investigation Committee is released December 15, 2014, by seven Nebraska senators and also by child evaluations and the evaluations of Dr. Natalie Baker when I was. Uh, record my mass evaluation before I was released from prison. All these documents are, are telling the truth, man, and seeing that I, at the time of my release, I was mentally ill and dangerous, and I was, I, they were obligated by Nebraska law to commit me to the state psychiatric hospital and make it and they did not do it because of racist hatred, man. That's my opinion, that it was a racist, it was all racist, and that motivated them to deny me mental health treatment and give the treatment that they, that they know the person that they got. Thank you for your time for listening to this story. I appreciate it. Man, I appreciate you, Nico. 